Okay, I'm going to go ahead and bring the jurors back in at this time. I believe Ennis, if you would, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. At the time that we broke for lunch, the state had rested, meaning it, it had concluded bringing all the evidence it intended to adduce in this case. At this time, I'm going to inquire of the defense if they intend to call any witnesses. Attorney Tucker? Yes, ma'am. I do plan to call Ms. Payne to the stand. Okay, you may. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm any testimony you shall give in this case today shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Yes, you may. Lower your right hand, have a seat. If you just put yourself up to the mic and project so that we can all hear you and that the court reporter can record what is being said. Uh, you may proceed, Attorney Tucker. If you could say your full name for the record and spell it out for the court tonight. Uh, it's Hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, Payne, P-A-Y-N-E. Okay, and Ms. Payne, um, where do you, have you lived in Bay County or Clayton County for close proximity? Uh, I don't want to get out of addresses, but have you lived the majority of your life? I have. I was born and raised in Clayton County and then moved to Fayette okay. when I was eight. Do you... Uh, have any family members that are law enforcement? I do, do you not. recall? Um, oh, what do you do for them? Um, I'm in property management for apartment communities, and I've been in that industry now for going on 10 years. Okay, yeah. so you came straight out of high school into that? I did. And that kind of industry, what do you do for, um, for your job? Typically, I'm in the field. I go from property to property, um, either collecting rent, um, sometimes walking vacant and or abandoned apartments, 
that could potentially be under construction and I would show vacant apartments to um, potential renters. Okay. So at times you were carrying basically tills for your company of a large amount of money? Correct, yes. Okay. And um, you testified that on some occasions or more occasions you have to show empty properties or empty uh, locations to people that you don't know or that you're told to by your company? Correct. Okay. Whether it be vacant apartments or vendors, either or. And how do you feel about that? I mean, it's it's a part of my job. Um, in the beginning, we had smaller properties where I was the only person who was going from property to property. Um, there were occasions that were unsettling, but it was it was still a part of my job and. The longer that I was with the company, the larger we got, the more properties we received, um, and the more, I guess, it, it put me more out um, alone, by myself, without additional site staff, without anybody with me. And they would know that you were going to these sites, correct? Uh, correct. Not exactly which ones. I would be kind of all over the place, depending on which ones I was going to. And because you were going to all these different places to meet people you don't know, did you do anything for your safety? I did. And what was that? I um, registered for a concealed carry permit, and when I received it, I purchased a firearm. Did your company know about this? Um, they did, yes. And were they in support of this? That was, yes, they were. And it was, un it was not unusual for other individuals with the same type of work to wear a gun or have a gun? Uh, no, not at all. Okay. And you said you purchased a gun. Uh, what kind of gun did you purchase? Uh, it was a Springfield and it was a XD because um, it was smaller so I was able to keep it concealed. Okay. And you got a valid permit, correct? Correct. What else did you do to help uh, make sure that carrying a permit or carrying a gun on your side would be safe? I would go to the shooting range and at different shooting ranges they offer kind of like a variety of options um, including self-defense kind of classes or tutorials rather. And did you ever take one of those classes or tutorials? I did. And which one did you take? Um, it was, it was a while ago, so I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly, but it was a self-defense, um, training course. Okay. And in this training, what did you learn from what they were teaching? Just how to properly store your weapon, how to properly remove your weapon, how to make sure that your safety when doing so doesn't cause accidental discharge. Um, and they would explain how when you pull your weapon out that the way you hold it is determined, is determined based on what you're ready to do. In other words, you keep your index finger on the slide until you're ready to pull the trigger. When you're ready to pull the trigger is when you put your finger into the trigger guard. All right, now when you say the slide, um, is that the top portion, the side portion, or like, is it a combination of both? Like the side. Okay. How your hand would just rest. And is that all that um, they were training for at that time? Um, for the most part, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they taught us, you know, how to load or unload and smaller things like that but have you ever had a accidental discharge of the firearm while loading or unloading no okay and did you commonly wear this weapon uh, every day where'd you wear it on my person you mean mm -hmm. i had a holster that went inside of my pants and i wore it on my front right hip was that visible to individuals no and did you do that purposely? I did. Okay. And uh, do you recall uh, May 7th of 2019? 
I do. Prior to that day, have you ever had to draw your weapon or find yourself in a position where you would need to? No. Okay. Um, so on this May 7th, of course, you've been hearing these stories. Could you tell us what happened on that day? I can. Um, I was on my way home from work, and I was coming up to an intersection where the light had just turned green. As I was getting ready to turn left, there was a semi that was turning right. Um, someone ran the red light, and I watched him run right into the tractor trailer. Okay. I pulled off to the side, and I got on the phone with 911 to just to give an account of what I had noticed. Um, I had assumed that the truck driver or someone else that was involved had already called and they hadn't. And if I could stop you right there, you said that you pulled off to the side. Whereabouts? Um, I pulled up onto the curb. Okay. Right through the intersection. And why did you do that? I wanted to get out of the lane of travel. Okay, so there was heavy traffic that day? It was pretty steady. Okay. And is that where you called the 911? It is, yes. Okay, and then what did you do? Um, after I got on the phone with 911, I was kind of explaining everything that I saw, and I started to walk over to the truck driver because um, I noticed that there was someone else who had witnessed it who pulled off to the side. And if, I'm sorry, nerves. You said you walked up to the truck driver. What was that driver's name? Uh, I believe it was Mr. Kimball. I, go ahead. So I um, walked over to the truck driver and we kind of just were conversing, asking, I don't even know what happened. And he just was confirming that we did have a green light. So um, I noticed that someone else had walked over to the other vehicle that was involved and was checking on them. I, after talking to Mr. Kimball for a while, um, he was on the phone with his dispatch the entire time and so I was kind of relaying everything that happened so that they were able to hear it from me and not just from him. Relaying it to whom? To his um, job. Okay. So his supervisor, I would assume. All right, so you're speaking with him, relaying to the dispatch about what was going on, confirming the light was green for him. Correct. And then what else happened? Um, after that, we were kind of just standing there waiting for the police to arrive and um, the other gentleman who had witnessed it walked over to us and he introduced himself and said that he was a state officer and he flashed his badge and said that he had checked on the other gentleman and that was asking us, are we okay? Is everybody all right? Um, and actually told me that he had saw where he ran the red light and confirmed it to Mr. Uh, Kimball as well. Okay. <clears throat> now, Clara. He came and um, identified himself as a state uh, officer? Correct. Okay. And you've heard a couple of times it being called a correctional officer or another name. Are you sure he, he identified himself as a state officer to you he told and to Mr. Kimball? Cor correct. He told me that he was a state officer. I didn't find out that it was a correctional officer until months later later when I found out from you. But he did show a badge? He, he did. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, he didn't pull it off. He just lifted his shirt and we saw the badge and then he continued. And how was he speaking to you or how was his demeanor to you and Mr. Kimball? He was trying to make sure everyone was okay. Um, making sure that we kind of stayed over here and that anything that, you know, we could remember that happened, we were kind of going over it with him. Um, but he, he seemed to be comfortable with the situation and making sure that all of us felt comfortable, I guess is the best way to explain it. Okay. So your voice on the 911 appeared to be kind of calm. And so that was the tone or how you perceived everybody's tone as this was continuing on? For the most part. I think that me and the truck driver were kind of more calm. Um, 
the officer, the way that he, it was kind of like he was, I don't know any other term other than kind of hyped up. Like he just, he wanted to make sure that he was in charge in a way. Okay. And what else did he um, state while you were sitting there waiting on the police to arrive? Well, we were, me and the truck driver were curious because we didn't know what had just happened. It seemed obvious that he ran the red light. So we were asking him if he was okay and if he was, if there was something going on. And he said, he's okay, but he said he's definitely inebriated. Are you sure that's the word he used? I'm positive because it prompted both me and the truck driver to reply simultaneously saying, do you mean he's drunk? And um, did Mr. Kimball's dispatch hear or overhear that conversation or hear the conclusion? I'm not sure, to be honest. Okay. So the state officer said that, and it kind of sparked yours and Mr. Kimball's attention. What happened next? Um, afterwards, we're still standing around probably another um, maybe 10 or 15 minutes now. Um, additional from the original 10 minutes or so and me and Mr. Kimball are continuing to speak and um, the state officer had walked back over because at this time the guy in the truck had got out of his vehicle. Okay. And when he got out of his vehicle did the state officer address him? Uh, he did. And what was it? He was just asking him what was he doing and what are you, where are you going, you know, just come out of traffic because his truck was still in the lane, so there were still cars that were passing, and he was just basically trying to make sure you need to just come out the way and stay out of traffic. So the, from your perception, the state officer was remaining calm, trying to direct, um, at that time you didn't know, but now you do know, Mr. Herring, to be safe and get out of harm's way, correct? Originally, yes. Okay. And then what continued from there? Um, I couldn't hear what they were saying, but he kind of started walking around and um, the officers started following him around the vehicle. And you could see him having conversations, but again, I couldn't hear what they were saying. And when you said walking around, walking around where? Um, his truck. And just in that proximity of just his truck? Yes. Okay, sorry, continue. So after he was walking around for a little bit, he kind of started, uh, he being the state officer, started to walk back over to us. And he was kind of just giving us this look like, this, this guy is, there's something, there's something that's up. And before anybody could ask, or either of us could ask him what he meant, he walked back over to him. Um, I was actually on the phone with my family when I was on my way home from work which I hung up to call the police. So during this time is when I took that opportunity and I kind of walked back to my vehicle and I was on the phone. I called my family back to let them know uh, what was going on. And it was to let them know what's going on or let them know that you were safe or? Correct. Okay, and is that when you made this second call, the 911 call? It is, um, I noticed from a distance that it was getting more tension, I guess. Um, couldn't hear the conversations, but I could see the hand movements and the gestures between the two of them. Um, again, I don't know what he was saying, but it was almost like he's trying to explain to him something, which is when I told them, I'm gonna call you guys back, I'm gonna call the police back because something else is, is going on, because he started walking towards his vehicle again, like the driver's side at that time. And when you called 911 the second time, was it kind of the same manner you did the first time? It was. Um, I was just basically explaining to them what I, what it looked like was about to take off, take place. Um, uh, assuming and hoping that they would say, okay, well, we actually have an officer. He's literally right there. Given the time frame, I would have assumed that someone would have been there by then. Okay. How many accidents have you seen before this one? Um, I mean, passed on the road, a few, witnessed firsthand, none. And have you ever been in an accident yourself? No. Okay. 
So this is the first time you're encountering any kind of accident really firsthand or close by? Yes. Okay. And you get back on the phone with 911 and what occurs then? I'm explaining to them um, what I thought that we had learned was that um, the driver who had caused the original accident was potentially drunk. And, and that came from what the state the officer state. said? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, and as I'm explaining it to her, I notice that's when he completely gets in his truck. He starts trying to turn it on and you can hear him like revving it to get it to turn on, um, which I, I think that all of us were shocked that it even turned on to begin with. And that's when he he started to drive away. And you said you were shocked. Why were you shocked that it started back up? I, there was fluids everywhere. It was smoking. There was, I mean, it was damaged. Was there a major impact? There was, yeah. I mean, the entire tractor trailer just shifted and rocked when he hit him. Okay. And you don't know what speed he was going at going through the red light? I don't. Okay. But you did see the effects it had on the 18 wheeler? Mm -hmm. okay. And then you are on the phone with 911. You see him jump into his vehicle, revving it up. And what happens then? Um, I'm just basically just telling dispatch that that's what's happening. I am explaining to her. He just got in his car and she asked me um, if I was able to get the tag number as he's pulling away. Were you able to get the tag number? At that point, I wasn't, no. Did it appear anybody had gotten the tag number? No. And were They were just trying to get out of the middle of the road. So people were trying to get out of the way. Was anybody screaming, get the tag number, or? I mean, at the time, all I could see was the state officer and the truck driver kind of, the state officer was kind of grabbing the truck driver, kind of telling him, you know, to get out of the way. Um, Where was this truck driver standing? They were, so if, if this was the, the lane where they were turning and the truck was kind of partially turned, they were standing at the, like, kind of the middle part of the intersection, which would have been middle part of the tractor trailer, which is kind of in front of Mr. Herring's vehicle. Okay. Did it uh, ever appear that any of them might have been in, Jeopardy of being hit when Mr. Uh, Heron was starting up his vehicle? Um, initially, it's not the first thing that came to, I think, anybody's mind. But then once he started revving it and just kind of took off, then yeah. Okay. And then what happened? So I'm explaining to the dispatch what happened. And as he's pulling off, she's asking me, you know, was I able to get the tag number? Realizing I wasn't able to, I was already at my vehicle. And I got in my, I completely got in my vehicle and went to go pull off. Okay. And at that time, the uh, truck driver and the state officer was still standing over in the street and he started waving me over, like calling me towards him. Okay. And when you got up close to him, what happened? Um, he, I asked him, did he go straight? And he said, yes. And he's telling me, he said, go. So at that time, you were under the impression that he's a state officer sending you to get the tag, and 911 knows that you're on the way to get the tag. Correct. Right. And he was, when I was in my vehicle, when he was waving me over, his motions were, it was almost like he was waving me on. So when he brought me up, when I got up to him is when he told me to go. Okay. And he said go, or did he say something else, or...? No, he just said, good, go, go. Okay. All right, so then now you're, you're going in the direction they pointed you and you're on the phone with 911. Was 911 saying anything? Uh, no, she was not. She, All right. I was just, there was kind of silence from the time that she had initially asked me if I had got the tag. Um, I was still kind of getting my bearings and I just started repeating to her telling her, okay, you know, he's going down um, Clark Howell or right. Forest Parkway. So you never heard them give a warning of not to chase or? No. <clears throat> and having heard the tape, did you feel that um, 
you were talking over it or you just didn't hear it or no I was explaining to her as we were as we were going down the road I'm explaining to her what's happening and from what how I remembered it she asked me again so were you able to get it and I explained to her not yet but I am about to and that's when she told me that she just wanted me to be safe I told her that I understood um, and that I wasn't chasing I was just going to follow just stay behind him to stay with him until the police officer could get to us so I was able to kind of accurately basically just keep them in the loop since they obviously weren't there yet okay um, so your impression at that point is that you're just going to get the tag and then hopefully that'll be it you just report the tag correct okay and did 911 ever come on and say hey we've already got the tag from somebody else no they she never did okay so um, as you're getting up close to get the tag what happens then as I'm getting closer um, I explained to her that I had the tag and she basically tells me that this is the way that I interpreted it was that she wanted both of us to go back to the original accident site because police should be there by now all right was that did she say something before that about you just returning or the only thing you heard was that both of y'all needed to be Cor correct she just told me she wanted me to be safe I told her I felt like I was safe and that's when she's I told her that I was going to stay with them until an officer could get to us um, and she said that that's what she wanted me to do at any time did you identify you had a gun or was carrying a gun I didn't so you're following the individual to get his tag and you get it and then your interpretation of what was said is that they wanted both of y'all to come back to the scene. Correct. So what did you do at that point? At that point is when um, we had both come up to the intersection and I saw him stopped in the turning lane. So I turned as well and when I stopped, I was under the impression with me having 911 on the phone that I could just be kind of like a messenger. So I took my phone on speaker and I took it to him to show him that I had the police on the phone. And I'm telling him they want us to go back to the original accident site. All right, at this point, you y'all have not made contact correct no we have not. so how far do you think you pulled over the distance between you and his truck um well he was in the turning lane and i was in what would be considered like the right straight lane um and the distance between the vehicles were probably i don't I, maybe the width of this table but there was no contact, correct? No, there was not. Okay. And did you have any fear that something was going to happen by walking up to him with the phone? I didn't think I had anything to fear. I assumed that having authorities on the phone, explaining that to him, that that would just mean, okay, we'll go back because you had not heard what the interchange between him and the state officer, correct? I had not, no. Okay. And as you approached him with a phone, how did you have it in your hand? Um, I had it on speaker and I was kind of holding it like in my palm with it kind of resting in my hand, just like facing him so that he could see it says 911. Now you mentioned that he was internally and was stopped, correct? Correct. Did you cause him to stop? I did not. And why would he be in stop in that lane? The only thing that I could think of was either he was merging and his vehicle finally gave up. Um, 
or that it, but it, okay, so the way that the lanes merged, I was assuming that he was either waiting for traffic, but then getting up closer, you can see all of the liquid, like underneath the vehicle, you can see the truck is smoking. Okay, and, and you said earlier that it might have just finally exhausted. Correct. Okay. I mean, and even when we were back at the original accident site, the um, the state officer and even the truck driver, but they were they were adamant that they don't understand how this truck has it just kind of blown. Was how they were describing it. Okay, so you intend to walk up with the phone, tell them, hey, the police are on the phone. What happened then? I was walking up to him and I am explaining that I'm on the phone with the police and that they wanted us to go back to the original accident site. Um, it's loud. We're near an interstate. It's a busy road. And I can't hear what he's saying t to me. But as I got closer, I heard him um, asking me, who the F are you? And I told him that I was nobody, but that I had the police on the phone. Um, and that they wanted us to go back to the original accident site. Okay. So you'd explain that to him. Did you have the phone close to you? Did you have it away from you? Where was the phone? It was kind of not extended, but partially of the way. Okay. And uh, what happened then? Um, apparently I was close enough for him to reach out the car and he knocked my phone out of my hand and he grabbed me by my wrist and he pulled me into the vehicle. Okay, now, you said apparently you got too close to the vehicle. Did it appear to you you were too close to the vehicle or? I wasn't thinking that I needed adequate space to stay away from him or anybody or anything. Okay, and then you said he knocked the phone out of your hand. Yes. And then he grabbed you. You said one was on your wrist. And where was the other hand? Um, and originally he had just grabbed my wrist and he had pulled me in the car and um, at some point my shirt had gotten grabbed okay. um, and he Go ahead, I'm sorry. he was pulling my wrist and he pulled me in the vehicle and he kept yelling at me telling me I have something for you um, and he used, I have some, pardon, but I have something for you, bitch. And he's leaning and he's reaching and he's pulling. And at this point, I remember that, I'm, I'm sorry. Take your time. I remember that. He had let go of my wrist and he grabbed me by the back of my neck. And it was as if he was trying to kind of keep a hold of me. Um, the entire time I'm, I'm telling him, I'm, I'm thinking, I I'm still have to be on the phone with the police. They have to know. Um, I'm telling him to let me go. And that's when he hits the gas and we go forward. Um, I'm still in the car at this point, and while it only may have been a few steps or a few feet, um, when you are being held against your will and you have no idea what's ahead of you and you're looking down, it felt like it lasted forever. And I just remember, it was like I saw my, like my life flash before my eyes and I thought I was going to go down Riverdale Road, um, out hanging out the side of this car. And the whole time, are you trying to get away from this situation? I'm trying to pull away from him, yes. And how did you do that? 
Um, I, my entire body was up against the vehicle and I'm just trying my hardest to push away with any part of me that I can, whether it was my, my arms or my knees, trying to just put distance in between me and the vehicle thinking I could get away from it and uh, was unsuccessful. And at one part, you hear yourself screaming, get the F out of the car. Um, what was going on then? I'm thinking that I have a better chance of not being drugged if he's not in the vehicle. Here is a bag that's been labeled evidence that we're going to call it defense. Exhibit number 39, 38, 39. Okay, and as you can see, it has been sealed and not open. At this time, Your Honor, I'm going to approach the witness, although, although I'm not sure until I open it. Do you see the writing on this right here? Yes. Okay. Does that identify a article of clothing? It does. Okay. And at this time, I'm going to open the evidence. from where he grabbed you? Uh, yes. Okay, where were those? I had marks on the back of my neck and kind of scratches along my arms, bruisings um, on my wrists, and scratches along my chest. Okay. Anything in the facial area? Yes. Um, I had a, a kind of a black eye but a bruised eye and a busted um, upper lip. And other, I guess, like sore spots, like or bruising and redness around the edges of my face. And all of this occurred while he was dragging you uh, forward towards your vehicle? Correct. Okay. And you said he was making a statement to you of, I've got something for you, bitch. Was there any other statements made that you can remember this time? No, he just kept telling me that kind of over and over again. 
and that I was nobody. Now, what was he doing in the vehicle while this was all going on? Um, before, but before he punched the gas is when he was kind of turning his body and he was reaching, like reaching behind him. Did you see what he was reaching for? I, no, I did not. Did you see any of the contents of the inside of his vehicle? During, no. Okay. I could see that there were things everywhere, but other than that, I didn't really. <clears throat> Have you ever experienced anything like that prior to this incident? No. Okay. And then what happened then? Um, well, after the reaching is when he mashed the gas. And when he mashed the gas, I, like I said, have no understanding of how far we went, how much farther we can go. At that point, I didn't know that it, we had stopped because we hit my vehicle. Um, and that's when I uh, drew my weapon. Right, now, you said mashing the gas. What did that sound like? Uh, you could hear the, the truck just revving and hissing from, like, the... Um, liquids spewing and it was, it was loud. Okay. And you stated that then you said you have a gun? I did. And what was your intent at that point? Um, my intent was that pulling it out, he would let me go and I'd pull away from the vehicle and that would be it. Did you ever stop trying to pull away from the vehicle? No. And explain to me how you uh, pulled your gun out uh, at that time. Um, it was in my holster on my right hip, and he had a hold of me, and I just, I, I pulled it out and immediately started trying to just continue to push against the door with it, like pushing away from him. Okay. And as you're pushing away from the door, what happens then? Um, he grabbed my hand with the gun in it. Okay, let me let me talk. Which arm did you pull, or which hand did you pull the gun with? It was my right hand. Okay, and you said he grabbed your wrist. Which wrist? He grabbed my right wrist. All right, and how did he have that wrist? Um, well, with one of his hands, he actually grabbed my wrist to pull it towards him. Could you tell which hand or arm he had grabbed your wrist with? Um, it was his left okay. because he had a hold of he he had released me with this hand from my neck to grab me with this hand. Okay. And the gun that was outside the door that you're pushing away from, he got a hold of that, correct? Correct. And what happened then? Um, after he originally grabbed it and was kind of pulling at it back and forth, is um, when he put his other hand on top and he started trying to actually yank it away from me. Um, and then he started to try to turn it, to pry it almost, like he was trying to pry it out of my, my hands so that he could take it away. And... Which angle was he trying to pry it out of your hand? Um, like a, away from me, so it was this way. Okay. And that obviously is not the way here. A wrist is supposed to move, correct? Correct. Is, is that what caused the bruising or the... It is. Okay. And you said he's trying to push it this way and pry it out of your hand? To me, it's what it felt like. Like he was trying to pry it out of my hand. And yes. you said another hand came over and grabbed it? Yes. Okay. From the top. You're up. I may approach the demonstration what she's saying. You may. This is a toy gun. Toy gun. Um, and even though it's a toy gun, it does have a slide on it. As you can see, that you pull back. There's nothing in this gun. It's a toy gun. So, if this is the gun that you have. Pointing it, say I and him in his seat. How was he? How did he have your wrist? Like this? This hand was here. Yes. Okay. And the gun was.
close here and he's pulling you forward. Yes. And you said he, he had you here but on this? He was closer. All right. So, and he had your shoulder with this hand, or what was this hand doing? That he let go. He let go. Once he got a hold of this wrist. So he came. And, and he, he grabbed the gun. Go. All right, you tried to grab the gun like this. Correct. Okay. And where was your finger? The same way that I have it now. And when he grabbed like this, that shows his fingers are right there over the trigger? Correct. Is that a correct? I mean, so, yes. But so it was possible any of the four digits got into that trigger? Correct. To get. Okay, thanks. Um, so that occurred, and he's grabbing the gun like that. What happens next? Um, he's pulling at it. He's pulling at it, and I'm just yelling at him to stop, thinking that if I could just get away, it'll just be over, I guess. Were you saying anything to him at this time? To stop. Were you saying it loudly? Yeah, over and over again. Yeah, I was screaming it. Okay, and then what happened? Um, as he's turning it towards, like that way, I'm being pulled and pulled and I can feel myself like pressing up against the car like my face is up against the door and as he's pulling it is when it the should the gun went off okay and you saw the pictures that showed your hand kind of pulled back um why would your hand or arm been pulled back like that? After it went off, my entire body kind of fell backwards. Like I, I was almost like I was falling over and I was trying to catch my balance. Um, and my arm was turned so far in that once it was, went off and I was released, it just kind of sprung back. What was going through your mind at that time? A lot. Um, I, I, I knew that I was still, had to be on the phone with 911 and that I was just trying to get away from where I've been trying to get away from for the last however many minutes and that I needed to communicate back to 911 what had happened. So you picked up the phone and? I, I turned and I picked up my phone that was on the ground and I, I told her what happened. Okay. At any time, did you look around for a shell? To no. To pick up a shell? No, I did not. Were you concerned about a shell? I was not at all. Okay. And when you got on the phone with 911, you stated that he pulled the trigger? Yes. And what else did you state? Um, to her, I had told her that he had just pulled the trigger on my gun. Um, and I remember kind of looking around and, and I noticed behind me that there was someone who was standing behind me and I asked them if, if they seen everything, if they would stay to you know, be a witness. Um, and he was asking like if we were okay. He's like, are you okay? Is everything okay? And, I told him, I uh, said, I, I mean, I am, but no, he's not. Okay. And I asked, um, I asked the, the dispatch for uh, an ambulance. Okay. So your concern at that point was to try to get dispatch to send the ambulance out? Correct. Did you look around to see if anyone were close? I or? did. And, and I, that's when I noticed that there were actually, I mean, there were police that were to me, it felt so close that all of this could have just, just been avoided. But you had no foresight or any kind of anticipation that it would conclude like this? I had no idea. And it appears that a lot of witnesses did come up to confront you or to uh, say what they thought they'd saw. I mean, originally, the, everyone that was standing around, they weren't, they weren't like saying anything direct. Everyone was asking each other what happened. Everyone was trying to figure out, like, well, where, where did this car come from, and how did this happen? Um, did any of them, or one particular, stick out to you? 
Only the one that was right next to me because I, I was assuming that he saw the whole thing. And did you know his name at that time? I did not. After seeing him get up and testify, do you know his name? I do. And what was his name? Uh, Cameron. Cameron. Williams. Okay. And he did stay around? Um, he did. I don't know where he went exactly. He kind of started to walk around where everybody else was. Um, and it was like I was still on the phone with 911, and I'm trying to explain to her what's going on. But at this point, I just, I'm kind of in a, a bit of a daze. I didn't, it was all over the place, honestly. And what did you do with the gun? Um, I reholstered it. I took the holster off my hip, and I put it back in the holster. Okay, and did it stay in that condition till the police came? It did. Um, I remember looking up and seeing that there was a police officer who was coming up from where he would have been at like the interstate area. Um, and as he was walking up, I was trying to get his attention because he was like walking towards all the bystanders, having no idea what was going on, having no idea who was involved with what or where or how. Uh, and I was trying to get his attention so that he knew here's the weapon so that he could have it. All right. Now, you said that the, a lot of crowds were saying stuff, trying to confirm what had happened. Uh, did you hear all that they were saying? Um, it was more a bunch of kind of questions. Um, after the police officer had come up, one of the people that was standing there were basically, again, asking what had happened did you, and she, she asked me, she said, did you just shoot him? And I told her, I said, no. I said, he, he pulled me into the vehicle. He had a hold of me, but that I never had my finger on the trigger. And why is that? I mean, number one, from training. And number two, I never had any intention on pulling the trigger. And in fact, you never did pull that trigger, did you? Correct. Now, the officers, of course, came up, took your gun. And was there another officer that you encountered at that time? Um, there was. I was standing on the sidewalk. I was just trying to stay out of the way. And the original officer who I handed my, uh, my gun to um, went into Mr. Herring's truck. Okay. And the other officer had come up, and everyone was kind of like, you know, pointing towards me, basically. And he walked up to me and just told me that until they could figure out what was going on, that I would be detained. Okay. So, as you said, kind of this fog's going on and you're in shock. Um, did you ever see that there was an opportunity to try to render assistance, or did that even cross your mind? From the time that it happened to the time that the police officer got there, the initial response for me was I was away from this vehicle. And I wasn't trying to interject myself back into a situation that I had just got away from. Yeah. And when the other officer detained you, did you did he put you somewhere? Um, he did, in the back of police car. gentlemen I am going to give you a brief break it's now 3 30 uh, I just ask that you report back at 3 45 thank you
Are you ready to proceed? Yes, ma'am. I'm trying to be a step ahead and uh, uh, the pictures. Okay. The out. Court appreciates that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and bring the jewelers in at this time. All right. Back in the state, Ms. Payne. You may be seated, thank you. You may proceed, Attorney Tucker. time that went in between that but from him taking my weapon to me walking trying to stay out of the way um, and I just remembered kind of going back and forth with the witnesses talking about again them asking what happened um, and I remember yelling for one of the officers um, to come on to come up um, and that we needed an ambulance I was asking where the ambulance was Okay. And you do recall being placed in the back of a car similar to this, correct? Um, cor yes. And there was a video that you've seen prior to today that shows what happens in this video, correct? Correct. And I will show you a small bit, and then I'll stop it so you can confirm that that is the video that you recall of the interview with you after, the, after being put in the vehicle. Does that appear to be you in the back of the car? Yes. Do you recall an officer coming up? You may not have seen him as well, but do you recall being in the back and having an officer come up? Yes. To speak to you? And does this appear to be a fair and accurate representation of what it was when they came and talked to you? Yes. At this time, Your Honor, I would like to tender defense exhibit number 39. 40. 40. 40. Yes. No objection, Your Honor, as long as we have that we only play the times that we previously discussed. Correct. Alright. 
show it, it cannot take over. Right. So this would be um, I've got it. Going through the PC, the PC has volume all the way up. <coughs> I've got the audio here. Did it play while we were on break? Oh, we never got that the volume. Okay. It, the video plays. Just crave everyone's patience while we get IT who is here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Situation happening that's fair, accurate representation. Of him walking up to the car. And yes. then, from what's going to occur here, I would like you to listen, please. And that one day, I'm Sergeant Marion, the Clayton County Police Department. All right. Can you just give me a full name and you might talk to me and tell me what happened? Okay. He ran to the 
mind? Okay. 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 Heard that? Um, is that 
What is your recollection of the count? To how it happened? Minus details. Okay. Generally. Well, well, how were you feeling at that time? I was overwhelmed. I mean, I, I didn't know what was really going on. Um, is that why I'm you wanted? I'm scared. Is that why you wanted to call your parents? Okay. And they had some pictures earlier that were presented. If I may uh, approach your honor. You may. Did you show me? Yes, I did. I showed some of Okay. Um, what I have here is Vincent exhibit number 27, 28, 29, all the way through. Here's the 30, 35. You recall seeing those when I entered them into evidence, correct? Yes. I may present, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Let's go in chronological order. Okay. Duh. Does this look like a fair and accurate representation of where it appears you were scratched? Yes. Okay, is that where when you said he was reaching for your head or trying to pull you in, that's where the marks came from? Yes. That didn't come from putting a sweatshirt on, did it? No, it did not. Okay. And this is defense exhibit number 28. Do you recall this? Yes. Okay. And this area here, is that, what is that? It's my wrist. Is that where the swelling or what? Yes. Is that your right hand? Um, I believe so, yes. Okay. And that would be swelling for why? What reason? Well, there was swelling on both. But on this side, it was from where I was grabbed. But then my right wrist is where it was being like twisted and pulled. Okay. And grabbed. Is this another... Another photograph of how your shirt ended up yes that day yes okay and when they were taking pictures they took a picture of here what was going on there um, you can't really tell in this picture but um, it was starting it was it was hurting like it was starting to uh, swell and you, there's irritation around it, I guess you could call it. Okay. And do you recall them pulling out a ruler to measure the marks on the back of your neck? Yes. Okay. And you recall them taking pictures of your hand there? Yes. Well, hang on. And describe what was going on there. Um, there were like scratches and marks all along my hands and on my fingernails. Um, there were a couple of them. And to try and remember now, I don't remember which ones, but there were a couple of them that had, were broken off when all of this was happening. And there's some marks over here. Do you recall what those marks were? Um, the one right on the top was where um, Detective Moore basically was asking me if I was showing her where it was hurting. And in that area, um, she wanted him to document that it looked like a, like a busted blood vessel. Okay. And do you read? Do you recall seeing this being presented into evidence? I do. Did you ever see that in the vehicle? Not at the time, no. But was that 
the biggest nightmare you had if that was in the vehicle? Yes. Is there anything else? I want to talk to you. Is there anything else you can remember about that incident that you might have missed from seeing the back of the truck or the back of the police car and speak with them and those pictures? Small details don't really resonate okay. very well. Um, I mean, it's been the only thing that I've thought about for the last four and a half years, but it's not, um, the details, no. Nothing that I can think of. Now, did you get an opportunity to speak to uh, other officers? Um, yes, I did. All right, and who was that? After I was taken to the police station, um, they put me in a interview room, um, and eventually a Detective Hayward um, came in and introduced himself and said that he was waiting on his partner. Do you recall who his partner was? I was Detective Moore. Okay. And do you recall how that interview went? Um, I remember feeling like I was waiting for hours. I didn't know what was going on. Um, I hadn't talked to anybody since it happened other than the police officers. And uh, I just I just remember like feeling like I was waiting for forever and I had no sense of time or even or what was going on. While you were waiting, did you do anything while you were waiting and sitting there alone? Um, I remember pacing, and that's when I, I noticed that my nails were broken. Um, so I started messing with my fingernails. I started, like, taking them off. One of them, I remember, was hurting, which is what made me realize it was broken. Okay. And do you recall any of the conversation between... Detective Haywood and uh, Moore in that interview? Not really. I remember that to me it seemed like they, they would kind of go back and forth between one being more interested than the other. Um, and they kept asking me the same things over and over again. Um, but every time they would ask me, they would kind of in insinuate like a a different narrative, um, which to me, I'm, I'm thinking that there's an obvious explanation that ev everybody that could have that was standing around would have been able to see what I said happened. Um, so to me, I didn't feel like it was, I guess, logical. So I was just confused. Okay. And you said they were insinuating that there was a different answer or can you give an example of that? I mean, if just trying to change like my wording, trying to instead of when I explained to them that I was at the side of his vehicle, um, when they went back to repeat what I had said, they they said, "So you you reached in his vehicle to show him your phone or something like that." And I just remembered, no, I that's not what I said. I was trying to tell them exactly what happened. They kept stopping me, and then they would try and turn what I was saying, um, and then they'd pass it back to the other person. At any time during this interview, did they tell you what was going on with Mr. Herring? No, they did not. No one said his status or? Never, no. And I remember asking Detective Hayward um, in the beginning, kind of, you know, is what's going on is have you have you talked to anybody else like insinuating can you tell me anything and he just said I feel like he kind of brushed it off and just said that he would have to see um, and that's when I asked about calling you know like my family so to your knowledge through this whole interview you didn't know the status I never knew no and 
getting questions, as you said, from both sides? Correct. How did that make you feel? Um, in the beginning when I was telling them what happened, I thought it was more of a kind of like a witness account, like here's, here's what happened. Uh, as it got further into it, I could tell it, to me it kind of started feeling like interrogation. Um, but originally I wasn't thinking that it, it could have, I guess could have been an interrogation because I'm just thinking that it was just, it was an incident that had a clear explanation as to what happened. Have you ever been in a situation like that before? Never. And having gone through that situation and here we are in court, is there anything you've learned from this situation or that sticks in your mind? Uh, from all this four years later, four and a half years later? That not everybody is going to have a reaction that you think they're going to have. And that clearly trying to do the right thing is not the right answer. You think you're ever going to help, help anybody else, try to help anybody ever again? No. As you just discussed, you remember having an interview on May 7, 2019 with Detective Morin and Detective Hayward. Correct. And you recall during that interview when you were discussing the original incident that occurred on Clark Howell that your vehicle was almost struck by Mr. Heron, correct? Correct. It was not struck? No, it was not. and that you were able to stop your vehicle before he came through the intersection. Correct. And um, at that time, you were able to go around and you pulled up on the sidewalk and waited to call the police. Correct. And while you were on scene at Clark Howell, you had no issues with Mr. Heron, correct? No, none. You never spoke to him directly? No. You didn't see any weapons on him? No. You never got close to him to smell any odor of alcohol on him? No, I did not. And he didn't threaten you in any way? No, I did not. And you never told the detectives or the police that Terry Robinson told you he was drunk? I did, yes. You told the police? I told 911 dispatch. Now let's talk about 911 dispatch. Now you also stated that when Mr. Heron took off from the incident location, you were already at your vehicle. Correct. And you had gotten into your vehicle, correct? I was sitting in my vehicle on the phone, correct. And Terry Robinson and Mr. Kimball were still in the street Correct. And you stated that he waved you over? Yes. And the only thing you heard Terry Robinson say was, go, go, go. Correct. That's your testimony today. Correct. <clears throat> so he never told you to take a picture of the tag? Mm -mm. Not that I remember, no. And you also testified today 
that you never heard the 911 dispatch give you a warning not to chase? No, I never said that. I said that she told me that she wanted me to be safe. And I said that from what I took it as was that she didn't want me to chase. And when I explained to her I wasn't chasing, I was just simply staying with him until a police officer could get to us. And the 911 dispatch indicated to you approximately four times to either not chase Mr. Herring and go back to the scene, correct? Incorrect. I only heard it one time and she told me not to chase, to be safe. She never told me to go back to the scene until after I had told her that I was behind him and that she wanted me to be safe. And in doing so, she said that she wanted both of us to go back. The, in its entirety or just what you're referencing? You can review the entire transcript. You ready? Yes. All right, you see on page one, female caller. Dispatcher tells you, okay, can you get his tag number? Your response, hold on, he's driving away. Um, it's a red, red Dodge Dakota. Give me one second, hold on. Okay, so he is going west down Clark Howell. No, I'm sorry, down Forest Parkway. Dispatcher, okay, so couldn't, you couldn't get a tag number? Your response, no, but I'm catching up to him right now. And the dispatcher tells you, okay, ma'am, we actually do not want you to chase him. We just want you to be safe. It's the first time they tell you not to chase him, correct? She didn't tell me not to. She just said that they didn't want me to because of my safety, at least is the way that I interpreted it. Okay, I'll give you that. So they told you that they do not want you to chase him, correct? Correct. And what did you say next? You can read it. I understand. Okay. And the dispatcher tells you after that, it's not safe to chase him. Second time, correct? That's what the transcript guy said. When we're listening to it, I don't remember hearing that, but. And can you read what your response was? I understand 100%. I'm not going, I'm sorry, I'm just going to get the tag number, um, if nothing else but I am going west down Forest Parkway and I'm almost up to him. So you told the dispatcher that you understood 100%, correct? That I needed to be safe, correct. And the dispatcher states after that, okay, after you provide the tag number, which you provide the tag number before you make contact with Mr. Herring, correct? Correct. And once she gets the tag number from you, she tells you, okay, 
So if you could go back to that location where the incident happened because someone is actually on the way to you guys now, is that correct? Correct. So there should be no confusion that she told both of you to go back to that location. Well, if you, if you keep, it's not confusion, it's just more to the conversation. Well, you said your interpretation was that she advised, you thought that she was advising you and Mr. Harris to return to the incident location, correct? Because that's what she says in the next line. Okay, I'll let you read it. Read the entire response from dispatch. From what the transcript reads is, you know. From the beginning, okay. F female caller or dispatcher? Dispatcher. Okay, so if you could go back to that location where the incident happened because someone is actually on the way to you guys now. And Terry Robinson and Mr. Kimmel were still at that location, correct? That was two out of the four people. Terry Robinson involved. and Mr. Kimball were still at correct. that location, correct? And that's the third time she's telling you to not continue to follow Mr. Herring and go back to the location. Correct. No, that's when she told me to go back to the location, the first time. She didn't say anything about not following. All right, and so what is your response to the dispatch at that time? You can read the next paragraph. That there's a police officer? Okay, well, there is a police officer there, but he is drunk. I'm not, I'm not, I'm sorry, but I'm here to tell you I'm not, not going to follow him because he's going to cause another accident. So... I will stay behind him until an officer can get to us, but until then I'm not moving. Right, so you were aware that dispatcher did not want you to continue to follow Mr. Herring, correct? Sure. Is that a yes? Yes. All right, and the dispatcher tells you after that, you know that's what I want. I want you guys to go back to the location where it happened and an officer will be out there momentarily. So that's a fourth time she's telling you again, don't follow and head back to the incident location, correct? Incorrect. Okay, so what am I missing? She said, which in the transcript it reads differently than what you can hear on the call. I'm talking about the transcript that's before you, Ms. Payne. I'm, I'm just speaking from facts of what I, I've known. I'm asking you to read. Right. If she could allow the witness to finish answering the question instead of interrupting her. The I defendant is the defendant is not responsive to the question I'm only asking her about the transcript that's in front of her so I'm going to overrule the objection and Ms. Bainey will answer the question that's being posed okay you can explain after you've um, indicated whether she's correct or not correct so can you repeat your question the dispatcher for a fourth time indicated to you that she wanted you to return to the incident location, correct? Correct, and not for a fourth time that she wanted me to not follow. Okay, you testified that you didn't cut Mr. Herring off on Riverdale Road. You saw him stopped in the turning lane. Is that correct? Is that your testimony? I said I saw him stopped in the turning lane, and I never used the terminology cut him off. Because in my eyes, I was still in my lane of travel. And do you remember telling the detectives on May 7th, 2019, that you got in your Jeep, you followed Mr. Herring, you told the dispatch that you were following him, and she told you that she didn't advise it. She told you to get his tag number. You got the tag number by the time you got to the end, right when I got to Riverdale Road, correct? Your Honor, objection. This is a very long question. She can break it up, maybe. Uh 
witness could understand it and answer a little bit clearer? Your response would be. And I'm asking her if that's what she said. That's the statement that she would have made to the detectives. I'm asking her, was that a statement that she made to detectives? Okay, so I, I'll overrule the objection. It's not a compound question. She's just asking if that's actually what she said, so I'll allow it. So if you're asking me if I remember word for word what I said four and a half years ago, I can not say that I do remember exactly what I said. And do you recall that you told them that you came around that curve and you had an opportunity to get in front of him? If that's what I said, then I don't remember. Like I said, exactly. It was four and a half years ago. There was hours worth of interview. So. And do you recall telling the detectives that you got in front of him and I stopped in front of him and I got out. Okay. You recall that? Again, I don't remember word for word what I said. I would have assumed that I would have explained what happened, which you were able to see in the pictures. So it's your testimony today that you did not cause him to stop his vehicle? Correct. Jeep? It, it was. And do you see how your vehicle is angled toward the red Dodge Dakota? No, I see his vehicle is angled towards mine. Okay, I can give you a better view. previously admitted as State's Exhibit 8. Now, is your vehicle slightly ahead of Mr. Harrington's vehicle? Slightly ahead, yes. Mm -hmm. And is your right passenger tire turned towards the right toward his vehicle? The tire is turned, but the vehicle is not. And so in order for you to get in that position, you had to turn your steering wheel to the right towards Mr. Herring's vehicle, correct? Towards the lane. And his vehicle is in that lane, correct? At the time it was further back, so no. So if it was further back, you had to turn your vehicle in front of his vehicle, correct? No. So how did you end up in that position? In this meaning, like with the cars connected or with me with you partially in his lane. With my front tire partially in his lane, my wheel was turned. Now you testified that you walked up to him and you were, does it sound like you described it, calmly telling him to that the 911 dispatch wanted him to go back to the scene? Correct. And telling him calmly that you were on the phone with 911? I mean, you, when you say calmly, do you mean, like, was I irate or was I, was I louder? That is your testimony today that you did not get out of your vehicle and run up to Mr. Herring's vehicle telling him to get out of the car? Correct. And you never once got out of your vehicle and go up to him and tell him to get out of the fucking car. 
Well, every, everyone heard I did. And so at no point on that 911 tape did you ever tell him to stop, I go did. back to the scene? I did. And did you hear that on the 911? Conveniently, no. Okay.
And so I believe you testified that as you were at Mr. Herring's window, his vehicle moved forward towards your Jeep, correct? Um, cor I was in the vehicle, but yes, correct. While that vehicle was moving forward? Correct. So do you remember speaking with the detectives May I approach your honor? Yes, you may. I'm handing you what's been previewed to Mark State's Exhibit 41, which is a copy of the transcript of your interview with Detective Moore and Detective Hayward. Can you turn to page 11? The page number will be at the top of the page. down at the bottom of the page uh, where it says your name and it starts with and yes and can you read that paragraph and he's just like who are you who are you I said I'm no one but I'm on the phone with dispatch I'm on the phone with the police you need to stop you just caused that accident and he's like yeah okay I got something for you and that's when he pulled forward and Detective Moore asked you, so at this time, it was just words being exchanged. There was no, he stopped, and then re, what did you respond? Uh, she stopped, mm -hmm. and I responded saying no contact. And she responded, no contact at all yet. And what was your response? Right. So at the time his car pulled forward, there was no contact between you and Mr. Herring, correct? It was between the vehicles. So when Detective Moore said there were just words being exchanged, there was no contact. Is That's your position she that she was just talking about the vehicles? That's what I would assume, yes. So words and vehicle? Yes. Where's the question tonight, Your Honor? Your response to the I'll move on, Your Honor.
Now, is your testimony today that you've never had your finger on the trigger? It is. Can you turn to page 49? Down at the bottom of the page where you see your name and it starts off, I mean. Can you read that paragraph? <clears throat> I mean, he's almost fully turned by pulling. And I think that was more so just a matter of us kind of going back and forth with him like this. Hannah is showing the position he is in. And he's pulling, and after he tried to pull the trigger, when he came back around is when I had my hand on the trigger, and um, he was, he still was squeezing, reaching, pulling, turning. But I'm pretty sure that in prior testimony, we were speaking of the trigger guard. And can you turn to page 41? Can you start down where it says your name? I pulled it out. I pulled it out and I had it up here. And Detective Hayward asked you where the muzzle was pointed. What was your response? Uh, it's more so pointing sideways. And he also asked you that he stated so the, it was not pointed at Mr. Herring, just raised. Correct. And he stated ready if you had to pull it. Uh, that's what he states, yes. And on page 42. And Detective Hayward states that he reaches out with his right hand so you know there is nothing, no weapon, or nothing in his right hand, correct? And what is your response? He, correct, well, yes, yes. And Detective Hayward asked you because you didn't see no weapons or nothing in his right. And what is your response? I didn't see anything in his, but he didn't have anything in his hands. And on page 40, turn to page 40. And at the top, I believe that's your response. And I had it, my gun in my hand. And Detective Hayward asked you, are you pointing it at him at this time? What was your response? 
No, I am not, I am not pointing it at him, but I'm pointing it away. No, I'm, I'm reread that. I don't believe that's what that says. I'm not pointing it at him, but I'm not pointing it away. Where it goes on to show that I was I, resting it on the window of the car. As I explained, I was pushing away. And so your testimony today was all of this could have been avoided, correct? Correct. And you also stated that you had no intention or you wasn't trying to interject yourself in a situation that you just got away from, correct? Correct. But that's in fact what happened on May 7, 2019. Interjecting myself twice or initially? So in the initial incident, your vehicle was not struck, correct? Correct. And so there was no reason for you to interject yourself in the final conclusion of what happened with Mr. Herring as far as that incident was concerned. Well, there's a lot that led up to that. So for me to have interjected myself to begin with was me doing something that I would have wanted someone else to do for me, which was to be a witness for an, what I thought was an accident. And you're not post-certified? No, I'm not. You're not a police officer? I'm not. Nobody deputized you on that day to apprehend anyone? No, they did not. And you also stated that you never had any intention of pulling the trigger. Correct. So when you told Mr. Herring that you would shoot him, you were just bluffing? Oh, it's not, a, I wasn't bluffing. I was, as I explained, thinking it was a deterrent, like I would be able to get away. And you said you had training with this firearm? Yes. And in that training, you didn't learn that you don't pull a gun unless you're going to use it? I learned that you don't put your finger on the trigger unless you're going to use it. And it was your testimony today in that interview that your trigger, your hand, your finger was on the trigger, correct? My finger was in the trigger, on the trigger guard, not in the trigger. They talked about this 911 tape with you. Um, during this 911 tape, as you heard it while you were sitting at the table, did it appear sometimes you were talking over the 911 operator and they were talking over you? It appeared that way, yes. Okay. And did it appear that when they were saying one time, we don't want you to change, we want you to be safe, that you were giving directions at that time? Correct. Could that be the reason you did not hear the first or the second time? Correct. Okay. Now, the kept, state kept saying that they said, don't chase, don't chase. But you recall them saying, be safe and come back to a location, correct? From my recollection, I remember them telling me not to chase. I told them I wasn't chasing. I was just following behind. She wanted me to be safe, and I told her that I understood that. I had no reason to think that I wouldn't be safe. Okay. And the last time from you saying, I'm just trying to get his tag, how many seconds went by before 911 came even back on the line to talk to you? Um, there was a large gap between both times of her originally asking me, can I get the tag? And I said, no, hold on. There was a, a large gap. And then she asked me again if I was able to get the tag. And there was another large gap. Right. And, and I recall hearing you walking at a fast pace to your car, to your Jeep, while they were asking about the tag. So did you get into your Jeep at that time? 
Yes, because I was sitting on my like my passenger side or standing at my passenger side. And, and you were on the phone concentrating to what 911 was saying, correct? Uh, correct, yes. Did you hear any outside noise of the um, state officer telling somebody to take a picture of the tag or to get the tag number? No. So you were doing what you were told to or requested to by 911? Yes. Okay. Now, um, state asked you a specific question, and I think you read the transcripts of you never had your finger on the trigger. But isn't it true that the portion you read said your hand was on the trigger? That's the way that I interpreted it, which is why I tried to explain about the previous statements. Is your hand different than your finger? It's a part of. Okay, but it's different when you're holding a gun to have a hand correct. versus a finger on a trigger, correct? Correct. And do you recall anybody ever coming in there to get fingerprints to check uh, the trigger to see if there were any fingerprints on the trigger? No, they never checked for fingerprints. They never took my fingerprints. They never even checked the fact that I had the marks or the ripped shirt or anything like that until way after. And did you request them to take pictures or to check that or did someone else? Um, well, uh, Detective Moore is who actually asked the photographer to come in after it was brought to her attention. And you mentioned that they were going back and forth, uh, Detective Moore and Detective Haywood, correct? Correct. And was it kind of a good cop, bad cop situation? In hindsight, yes. Okay, and did it appear they were looking for a certain answer or they were changing the words to get that answer? That's what I, how I explained it. That's how I felt. Okay, and now you stated that, you know, there was no contact um, and you stated you thought it was the vehicle, vehicle, correct? Correct. Was there any contact with the vehicle? At, prior, to, prior to the question they asked? At that point, there was not. But was there, had he grabbed you or done anything to you prior to that? Um, prior, I'm sorry, prior to, to, what are you referencing? To the vehicle moving forward and hitting your vehicle. And that's the contact you thought they were talking about, correct? Correct, correct, yes. So when he had a hold, and then once he grabbed a hold of me, after that is when the vehicles hit, which I didn't f figure out until after the fact, of course. Now, um, it said you pulled it out and possibly had pointed it sideways, but the gun would have been sideways. You stated pushing off of the car, correct? Correct. So is that when he grabbed your wrist? Yes. So the gun would have been pointing kind of upward or downward, not at him when he grabbed your wrist, correct? Correct. Okay. And when he grabbed your wrist, he tried to pull the gun into... I'm catching your eye, I'm leaving. God, it's crossed, so Your Honor. I'm, I'm sorry, I thought it crossed. You can ask leading questions or ask questions about what they you're asked. You're redirect. At, at this point, you're not cross-examining, you're redirecting. So I will right. sustain the objection right. as to leading questions. So what was the position of the gun uh, as was asked by the state when it was resting on the boot? It was in my hand and I was like this. So it was like towards the steering wheel, I guess, is where it would, the natural position would be until it was grabbed. And then once it was grabbed, it was back and forth. But inevitably in the end, it ended up to where it was being pulled that way, like away. And, and you were asked about hearing your voice on the 911 tape. Um, did you hear your voice saying stop on the 911 tape? I couldn't hear any of my, what I consider cries for help on the 911 tape. Do you recall a, a Cameron Williams that came and testified that had a video? Yes. Okay. And do you, rec do you recall after the state had taken him back to refresh his memory and then he came back to finish his testimony, do you recall hearing the video? I do. What did they say in the video? 
you can hear me saying stop, stop, over and over again. And the phone was right there close to you? It was. So obviously it just wasn't loud enough to be on the I don't want to. I mean, my voice projection didn't change for me yelling from get out of the car to stop. So I, I don't know how it picked up one and not the other. And it stated, the state requested that this could have been avoided and asked you that question. Do you call that? I do. How could it have been avoided? Um, initially, me not trying to do the right thing and in the end I don't know just trying to stay away from the original scene put it that way okay so there's you said at the beginning but at the end it could have been avoided a different way I believe if there wasn't, if he wasn't trying to take it from me, it would have never went off. And you would have never pulled it had the situation not escalated? Correct. Okay. And you told the detectives, as well as the 911, as well as the people around there, that you never had your finger on the trigger? Correct. And if anything, your hand was on the trigger guard? No, well, that's where your hand's rest is alongside. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You talked about the fact that it could have been avoided had you not attempted to, I guess, assist or help. But this actually could have been avoided if you not had introduced a gun into this incident, correct? I introduced the gun to try and save my life. Nothing further, Your Honor. And just briefly, uh, she asked the question to interject herself. Objection. What is the objection? He's already directed the witness. And you're saying, I think, if I could redirect again what you've done, another question, another question? Um, I'm going to sustain the objection, attorney. Yes. Have you concluded uh, with this witness, attorney? Chuckler? Obviously, I'm completed. Yeah. Yes, I am. I did it with the witness. Okay. You may step down. Does the defense have another witness? Not that should have the subpoena, Your Honor, no. So the defense rests at this time? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, does the state intend to use any rebuttal witnesses? Yes, Judge. Okay. Um, can counsels please approach?
Council's approach again for just a minute, please. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I am going to release you at this time for the evening and ask that you return tomorrow at, um, well, hopefully you'll get here by 8.30 so that we can promptly start at 9 o'clock. Um, you are released for the evening with the instructions that I previously gave. They still apply. No discussion, no social media searches, um, all the instructions that I've given. And uh, hopefully you'll have a good evening and we'll see you back here tomorrow at 8.30. Thank you so much. So just to place on the record what was um, discussed at the bench, uh, we're going to conduct the charge conference or pre-charge conference at this time. Um, the state will call its rebuttal witness tomorrow at 9 o'clock, um, but at this time we can go ahead and look at the charges and determine what uh, will be read to the jurors tomorrow. Um, Attorney Tucker, were you able to receive a copy? Yes, uh, I believe the clerk came out and made a copy for everyone of mine. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if she gave it to me or not. I think what, what was discussed in her email is kind of similar to what I wrote all over the uh, paperwork, and I agree on some of the, I think on the majority of the issues brought up, I agree with and minor just notes on the charge itself because there's duplicate charges, there's gaps, there's some other stuff. So I think if we go through and make sure that every charge is correct the way it's said and some of ours are the same, I think we can go to the order of what it needs to be and that should satisfy. That I don't think there's something that I'm gonna jump up and really object to because all of it looks like pattern. Okay, all right, so um, let me, I'm going to step off the bench for just a minute. Let me just see if the staff attorney is here so that we can go ahead and try to handle this portion of it. Um, for those of you that are sitting in the courtroom, um, pretty much we're recessed in terms of any evidence. We're just doing charges, what the jury will be charged with. Um, so you're free to remain here or you're free to leave. Um, this is just something that the court has to handle with counsels at this time. So I'm going to step off for just a couple minutes and then I'll be back to review the charges. State, uh, was the state able to send um, 
any revisions to the staff attorney? Yes, I've sent um, my revisions to staff attorney and defense. I don't have any of their suggestions or their requests at that revision. Nothing from <coughs> defense attorney? I have his original request to charge that we did, both did in October of 2022. But I don't have anything. <coughs> If there's, if there's something more important, I have one email, but his comments and suggestions and things along those lines, I don't have. You do not have. And, do not. and I believe the staff attorney came out this morning to take my copy and make copies for all parties. That was my understanding that she came back later on and gave me my copy back. Right, but did you email anything to um, to chief assistant or to ADA? I, I emailed and explained that I made my corrections on these documents, but it was similar to her. Um, comments and documents and that I would have this present and available and that's what I was understanding the staff attorney did was make copies for all parties okay but there's all similar right. comments and similar statements that I think we sit there and just go through it we did not get out there's not going to be much objections okay all right give me a second I'll be right back 